Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ask Anything presented by Mosher Consulting. I'm your host, Angel Leon, Mosher's HR advisor. In this week's episode, we're bringing back our colleague, Marcus Reed, Mosher's operations and science leader, with whom we had a tremendous conversation about radical transparency earlier in the season. This time, Marcus will be joined by Atlassian's own Ken Urban to talk about how to modernize collaboration work management tools at an enterprise level, regardless of your industry. In today's world, organizations are under increasing pressure to fast track the introduction of new products and services to maintain their market positions. This could mean that it is time for executives to look at enterprise level solutions to get results with digital transformations. Atlassian can help you bring company-wide organization to your projects focusing on universal business functions to break silos and increase workflow efficiency. Collaboration management tools like Jira, Trello, and Confluence enable organizations to deliver new service offerings, expand into new market segments, and rapidly implement company initiatives that push innovation forward. The best innovation emerges when teams across your organization are able to work better together. That's what we're going to be talking about today with Karen Irvin and Marcus Reed. Ken has 20 years of experience in the IT industry. He started his career fixing computers at the University of Pittsburgh and held several different positions there. He then did a short stand as a defense contractor writing code on various projects ranging from simple signal deconfliction to complex control systems. Just before joining Atlassian, he served 10 years in public service as a civil servant within the intelligence community working to build and maintain one of the largest and most complex multi-tenant Hadoop cloud systems. He has a bachelor's of science in computer science from the University of Pittsburgh, and he is a certified flight instructor and serves on the board for his local flying club. Marcus is the leader of Mosher's operations design offering, providing technology and methodology evolution together as a holistic and internally cohesive solution with clients that range from startups to Fortune 50 and Topic 70 members. Within the program, we offer production ecosystem design, solution architecture, tools administration, workflow automation, agile coaching, DevOps coordination, implementation of Atlassian suite like Jira and Confluence, and much more. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have you with me here today. How are you guys? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Doing good, Alan. Hell, thanks. All right. Well, let's start uh, with the first question here. Digital transformation is a very busy phrase. What does it mean and how does it enable new ways of working? Yeah, that, that's very true. That, and we have a lot of buzzwords in tech, right? Um, so as you... Um, you know, I came from government and I actually work with, you know, the largest company in the world, the U.S. government, right? So my answers are going to tend to focus on their perspectives, but the challenges they face are, you know, they mirror the challenges in commercial companies, as Marcus will, will probably say as well. Uh, just sometimes those challenges are amplified by scale or solutions are limited for legal or regulatory reasons. So to address the question, I think I'd like to start with a little story. Back when I started with the, the U.S. government, we had to fill out timesheets in PDFs and email them to our supervisors for signatures. And, and then our supervisor emailed them to payroll, right? So that's digitally transformed, right? Do you think that fits the dictionary definition of digital transformation? I, I think right? so. Yes? I, I think so. Yeah. But I, I got one better for you. Um, when I started working with the government way back, uh, like you did, we didn't do that. We actually had to handwrite our time down in a sheet of paper and then have them come in and look at that sheet of paper, sign it, and then they would take it in a DOS-based system and upload yep. it into that. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. So that was a digital transformation, right? Well, not really. That only marginally improved the outcome. And by the way, the, the uh, paper time cards had went away only about a year or two before I started. That's what I was told. Yep. Um, yep. So... You know, it's not just the, the traditional about going from analog to digital anymore. Um, so I guess maybe the name is a bit of a misnomer now, but I would say today, uh, digital transformation is more about agility, uh, achieving more and better outcomes with less and bringing modern tooling and practices, you know, meaning, meaning culture into your way of working. Mm -hmm. So we can no longer afford to have those silos and, and to do things like waterfall development, right? We need to stop building software and throwing it all over the wall for ops to run. We have to be, you know, more agile. We have to adopt agile methodologies like DevSecOps and, you know, that encourage a collaboration. Um, and we can't stop there, right? We have to, you know, furthermore, take that to the agency or the company level and do scaled agile. 
Another part of this is intelligent automation. It's also essential to improving the speed and quality of decision making, as well as the productivity routine. You want to stop doing, you know, the mundane tasks and get the system to do it for you. Uh, I'd like to take testing as a good example, right? So, mm. uh, again, in the government, we had, you know, software releases had to be compliance tested. They had to pass to make sure they they matched certain regulatory requirements. Uh, and that was a very manual process, even with automated testing already built in, right? Because we had to go over each individual test and make sure that it met the compliance for each version of the law, right? So how do you digitally transform something like that? that that's tough, but you know, I suggest shifting the paradigm entirely. Stop certifying the software, start certifying the tests, right? And then look at the tests for anything that failed or irregularities. That way, you know, your test teams who are not, you know, your, rather your compliance teams who are not considered technically, you know, tech teams or more legal teams uh, can start writing their compliance tests in a more agile manner and they can do it iteratively instead of waterfall. I think you bring up a really interesting point, Ken. When we were talking about digital transformation, we're tempted to think about just the tools yep. and just the Absolutely. code. And it is that that's it's really not super meaningful by itself. It has to include modernizing the methodology. In and that terms has to come of, first. Mm hmm. Mm. Right. Or, or together, if you can swing it, right? Yep. That, that's where I try to come in. My group tries to come in, is doing those things together. It can be daunting, but if you do, but I often say if you try to, modernize your tools without modernizing your methodology and very importantly leadership and the metrics that they use and the way they manage downward and the way they manage upward then you don't have a stable it's like building a stool do you want one leg two legs or three legs you always yeah. want three legs right <laughs> yep yeah i'd have to say one of the things that i wish i had when i was in government to talk about that managing down versus managing up uh, was a tool that did something like Scale Agile to help me, you know, better inform my leadership. Um, I had, so I was a program manager for a while, right? Or we called it a tech lead. Um, but I had to do monthly reports, right? And, you know, those slam them together in a spreadsheet after you've pulled the data out of the JIRA, right, from the dashboards that you use to track your team's work. Uh, then you put it in a PowerPoint presentation and pretty it up for your management. And well, guess what? That's out of date the moment you pulled it out of the system, right? Um, that's useless to them. You show up in the meeting and you end up going, uh, sorry, that slide's wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I've been through a similar experience um, at a very large company where the leadership pointed their finger downward and said, you guys be agile now. But by the way, um, the last of the, at the end of the month, I want my red, amber, greens and my Gantz. And so it was somebody's full-time job to take all the metrics that we were running on and that we were measuring our progress on and doing all our planning with and converting it to the simple deadline-based report that was manually created. And with JIRA, one of the things I really like about it is that not only can you always have real-time information on those dashboards, but it shifts, it allows, and this comes back to methodology again, it allows that tool allows this modernization and leadership where instead of just saying, okay, these are the deadlines we set six months ago and how are we doing towards those deadlines? And we lose track of, are we delivering value quickly, frequently? Um, what, is the, what is the amount of value that we're delivering? What are the trends in our teams upward and downward? Yep. In, term, in those terms, um, those are the things that JIRA allows leadership to focus on instead of just a deadline. Yeah, I agree that the challenge I had with, with just doing it with just JIRA was that I couldn't really articulate the dependencies across programs. Um, so like I may have a dependent or let's, let's actually put it this way. I was depended on by a lot of teams at the agency, right? Because I was at a platform. Um, so when I would advocate for more resources or staff, it was really hard for me to show that, you know, these 13 other teams were blocked by me not having progress. 
And so a tool that does scaled agile that can show those outcomes, like track it from the top down as well. You know, I mean, you're feeding it up from the bottom up for data, but from the top down, they're looking in and they're going, I want a mission outcome here. And why is this mission outcome not progressing? Well, they can look at that and see it in, in something like Jira Line and say, well, it's because you have 13 teams depending on you and you're not getting this one task done here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's informing me that says I'm blocking you know, 13 other teams or maybe a low priority task for me, but it's also informing leadership that why is Ken's team so dependent on the agency? Maybe that's okay, right? Maybe like I'm supposed to be that core right. cog in the wheel, but maybe it's not okay if I don't have the staffing for the resources. Yeah, you can be the cog that's in the middle of everything as long as you keep it turning, right? Right, <laughs> yep, you gotta keep it grease. <laughs> yeah, and that's, it's, that's it's what I really wish I had, sorry. No, that's, that's right. I was just going to say, it's interesting that you mentioned that because our, our next question has, I think, a lot to tie into that subject. Because if you are part of a larger group and you are that guy in the middle that might be holding the process, you know, from coming left to right, just to say something, mm -hmm. then that basically stops everything from moving forward and it stops progress. So. Yep. To sort of tie that in uh, with a nice bow, uh, what is the benefit of connecting development, IT ops, and business teams work processes? So again, talking about that guy in the middle, if you're not moving and everybody else is coming right behind you or right next to you to try to do their part, this yeah. has a lot to do with that. Yeah, so I have another great example from my time in a government. And and I, I just want to be clear, I'm not beating up on them. It's a, it's a great place to work. Um, this was very early. This was over 10 years ago when I worked there. So a lot has changed. It's not like that today. Um, yeah, but when I started on day one, uh, as a knowledge worker, what would you think that I would need to start working on my job? Access. I mean, yeah. Yep. Access a computer, okay. right? Yeah, yeah, computer, yeah, access, yeah. Um, you know, all the basic tools that we have, email, you know, communication yeah. tools, et cetera. So there was a one week period where I was going through um, uh, a train, call it training. It was unique to the government, right? It was just the legal pieces that you had to go through to get sworn in and learn how to be a government agency, fill out those PDFs, right, for the timesheets. That you don't need any of that for. What, what do you think I had on day one when I actually showed up in the office for work? A chair. Yeah, a chair, and that was it. <laughs> I had no computer. Yes. <laughs> I had no access. It took over two weeks to get me that, right? So, I mean, it's not that bad now because they've started tying this stuff together. But, you know, I'm sitting in the office. I got nothing to do. I nearly quit out of boredom in those two weeks. Now, imagine if the day I got hired, you know, this, this is a long process, right? It was months for me. I got, I got hired. I got my conditional job offer. I got my security clearance, and then I started. So what if HR communicated with IT operations and facilities to have all of that ready for me on day one? What if you took it a step further and said, well, I'm going to automate this so that that new computer or you know, a recycled one gets pulled out of inventory and sits on your desk when you come in on Monday morning? What if the accounts were auto-provisioned and even better yet, deprovisioned automatically when I left, right? Instead mm -hmm. of being a manual yeah. process. You know, um, just as a contrast in industry, when I showed up at Atlassian on day one, all of that was done that way. I had a laptop, I had accounts, I had a place to sit. There was no downtime. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that was because there was, you were talking about dependencies across, um, pr across different parts of the organization. Here you're talking about dependencies across the whole enterprise. So you're describing a situation where HR has JIRA and yep. IT has JIRA, and legal has JIRA. And we can see the dependencies between these business areas. And from an operational perspective, that's great. And then also we can identify trends and see bottlenecks and things like that from a leadership perspective where, hey, look, used to take legal a week to onboard somebody and now it's taken three weeks, what's going on? Right, and, exactly. Yeah. 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 I just thought it was useful to provide a non software development ex a example there because it's, you know, like we've said before, and I'm probably going to keep hammering this, it's not just software development teams, it's right. all the teams, right? So, how does, how does Atlassian, and I guess, yeah, we really shouldn't just say JIRA, we should say Atlassian. 
Um, cause you guys have, I mean, you've got your big heavy hitters like Jira confluence, Bitbucket, bamboo, but a lot of other stuff too, that I'm, I can never keep up with cause you guys are constantly acquiring or building new stuff. Um, but what about those teams? When I go into a legal department at some big corporation and I go, I'm here to help you guys be agile <laughs> and here's your tools. And they go, well, look, we've got, we don't, we don't really operate in terms of our processes, we don't really operate um, in a world of complexity and unknown unknowns and things like that. We have very simple process that's repeated over and over again in most cases. How well does a platform like Atlassian, what's the best way to help implement the tool and maybe not necessarily a pure agile methodology? Yeah, so that's one of, in my opinion, one of the great powers of the Jira platform, or the, I should say the Elastian platform, right? Um, whether you're on-prem or in the cloud, uh, I'll give a really brief example before I go into the why. When I started in the government, I also stood up a Elastian stack that was for software developers. Um, 10, 10 years later, it, you know, at the beginning, it was 100% software developers. 10 years later, 40%. Um, mm-hmm. So that, you know, 60% of the users were non-software development teams. That, that tells you the power right there. Now, you don't have to use all the bells and whistles. It can do the simple workflow tracking. It doesn't have to do agile, that we have business project templates in there, right? You don't even, although I don't recommend to do that for non-agile teams, unless they really just want the you know, very simple workflow thing. What I suggest is to start them with a project, a software project of their basic workflow, get them acquainted with something. You don't have to call it a sprint. Let them use the backlog and drag it in and, and say, that when you're going to start this work, you know, this batch of work, and when you're going to stop this batch of work, you know, ignore the word agile for them. They don't right. care, right? They, they think, oh, it's software development. Um, you know, if I get into a philosophical discussion with somebody about it, I look at them and go, well, guess what? Agile wasn't invented for software development. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Toyota basically, you know, started that conversation for yeah. manufacturing cars. <laughs> yeah. It was born out of uh, lean and continuous improvement right. yeah. and then i hand them a copy of the, of the phoenix project and say read this and tell me what software development's in there right yeah i'm like we can do this um we don't we don't have to care about the terminology we just have to care that you're doing your work um in a transparent manner that you're collaborating with others and that you have a defined process that i can see as an outsider so that i know where things are right absolutely yep so to, to kind of tie that into um, what you were saying, Ken, the modern, the modern business environment has changed. IT teams have to deliver digital products faster, ensure business apps are always on and have flawless service experiences. How is the mindset of development work going to have to change to account for all this? Yeah, and, and again, it's not just IT teams, right, and digital products. It's, it's all mm-hmm. the teams and all the products. So I, I just want to kind of stump that, you know, again, um, to kind of get that across to everybody that's listening, because uh, I think it's important, right? Uh, we need to transform all of our teams at all of the levels to, do, to operate this way to be competitive. Um, but, you know, we'll focus on IT and software products for now. Um, there's, there's not, as I said earlier, any more, you know, build it, throw it over the fence and let ops worry about it, right? Um, we have very complex systems now, right? Uh, we, we can no longer consider just how, what the use cases are, but the failure cases, uh, we have to consider the security boundary, the abuse, the hacking that might occur both inside and outside of the firewall, right? Um, we have to have defense in depth, you know, as you've seen with the, the latest hacks that have happened, um, you know, against all sorts of users, um, not just abuse. Uh, we also need to, to think about how we're investing in our teams now. Um, you know, previously, and, and maybe this is a little bit of my government experiences, you know, when you hired somebody, um, there was very little training that happened um, outside of the government specific pieces. Or, you know, even when I was working as a contractor, it was you were hired and you were presumed to know the job and to never really need training. Um, you, are, you were the expert, right? Um, that has to change, right? So we're not, you know, we need to invest in people. We need um, to train our developers. It's ongoing learning now, not just new development tools and languages, but, you know, in things like how to write secure code. Um, And also, I think another important 
point is, is that the non-software development teams like IT, they're not cost centers. Mm -hmm. They're critical to your business operations. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll, I agree with everything you've said, Ken, and I'll build on it a little bit too and say when, when we're talking about delivering value more frequently, maybe not faster, maybe faster, but definitely more frequently. And that that value needs to be laser focused, right? That we're delivering, otherwise it's not value. If it's what we needed a year ago, then it's probably not exactly what we need today. Yep. And so that increased delivery uh, frequency helps us with that. Um, we're shooting lots of tiny arrows at the target from close up instead of trying to shoot uh, a trebuchet from a half mile away and hit the target, right? And the tools are really important for that. And, and, but whenever I, I think a lot of managers and C-suite folks, when they hear well, everything's shifting, we have to go faster, 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 risk comes up. Yep. And the, um, the transparency that we talked about in an earlier episode is really important, but only com and combined with and facilitated by the right tool platform that's integrated where you've got a single source of truth, which is when I, you know, I, I'm not an, I'm not an Atlassian evangelist. That's Ken's job. Um, we work with all <laughs> kinds of platforms and tools and operations design. Um, but when I realized that what this was, was a single source of truth that could, could, could span an entire enterprise. If you combine that with transparency and the kind of collaboration the cross-functional collaboration and, and view into what different groups are doing, that risk comes way down and allows you to go ahead, to keep going fast and decreasing risk at the same time instead of increasing risk. There's an older methodology and older tooling platforms. The way that you decreased risk was by going more slowly and it did not provide safety. It only provided a sense of safety yeah, and, all and, the sense of safety, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think you mentioned something, uh, Marcus and Ken, about technology and the tools that we have. One of, the, one of the funniest lines I've ever heard was the agency that I used to work for, uh, which we would always call our technology, uh, yesterday's, yesterday's technology today. <laughs> um, because we were behind, um, like you said, Ken, and unfortunately, you know, going back to the, uh, to the, the, example I gave at the beginning with the timesheet, I mean, they had that process in place up until almost 2010. Um, and we're talking about 11 years ago. And, you know, yep. for an organization to have such a process in the 2000s, even though, yes, it's 2010, it's not, but still. Um, That's that, not that long ago. Right, right. And, and, and it still felt like the process that we put in place compared to other process that I see in the timekeeping world, it was still a little bit behind. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, uh, when I was at university, we used a web-based system for tracking time. When I became a government contractor, I used a web-based system for tracking time. I showed up and was told, here's your, here's your PDF. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. And I, <laughs> it, yes. And I, and I'll give you a further example. So, we had a, a sister agency, if you will, that used the same software we used for time tracking, for timekeeping. And they took it a step further where they allowed their employees to actually use that software on an unclassified platform where they could just use their cell phone. It wasn't through an app, it was just through a website, but they were still allowed to go through their unclassified platform, use their cell phone, uh, to put in their time, whereas we had to use the classified network to go in. We had to physically be in the office yep. to go in to do and something as simple as put eight hours in every day. Yeah. Yep. And to track your leave, you know. Yes. And it was, it was fun. So they had a web based system when I was leaving, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> so methodology is something that involves culture change and take and can take a lot. It doesn't have to take a lot of time, but it can. It goes faster when we've got the tools to help us. But I see a lot of times organizations want to treat 
tool modernization the same way as they treat methodology modernization, which is step by step. And no, you can't make a quantum leap from this all the way to that. That's a, that, oh, that Atlassian, that looks great, but we're not ready for that. We're going to get something that's not as good and do that for a while. And then maybe someday we'll be ready for Atlassian. And that drives me nuts. Yeah. Well, but how do you, how, how can we synchronize, you know, the methodology modernization with a more rapid acceleration of tools in modernization is something yeah. that we get into a lot. I mean, I, I have to give them credit. At least that is an attempt to think in an agile manner, right? So iterative approach. So there is that. Um, that being said, I would posit that, you know, the right tool, um, be it an Atlassian application or, you know, even a non-Atlassian application for the job uh, that allows you to work in an agile manner mm -hmm. is going to allow you to take that iterative approach in the tool so that you can adopt it. And, and you don't have to, you know, buy a second tool or a third tool or, or go through that. You can actually just, you know, I mean, I, oh, it, it pains me to say this, but if you really want to, you could do waterfall development in Jira, right? I mean, right. it's flexible enough. You could make it happen. So I guess the point that I'm trying to get across here is the right tools actually enable you in the journey as well. So I wouldn't think of it as a quantum leap by buying, you know, the right tool. It's actually just setting yourself up for success. So get the right tool and the right part of one of the criteria for choosing the right tool is can we continue initially in our little baby steps culturally and method yeah. methodologically and still have kind of kind of have this future proof for our maturity and our evolution? Absolutely. I mean, there, there is something to be said for ripping the Band-Aid off, but you will probably get a lot of pushback there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to get the CFO to sign off on a six month disruption where we don't make anything. Yeah. And if you were to <laughs> narrow that down and say, well, we could put, you know, and I'm just going to use Jira because it's the example I'm most familiar with um, Jira in place in a weekend when nobody's working, hopefully you don't have your people working on the weekends. Um, mm -hmm. Transfer all the data over and you can just come in and the only thing that'll be different is the UI. Um, that's an easier sell. Yeah. Yep, and we've done um, just recently something very similar with a transition um, into Jira service management from yep. an older standalone platform where we had a, nobody else was working that weekend, but we worked yeah. you know, Friday. It, and, and, and honestly, we got it done. We got it 90% done in a few hours on Friday evening. Yeah. So it was, it was amazing. And yet we had a lot of culture shock in terms of, wait, the button used to be two inches further to the right. Yeah. And now I, now I can't use this. Um, but, yeah. but th that's an exaggeration. There were some very, there were, there were some genuine oh, but that happened. differences. Yeah. Um, <laughs> genuinely shocking differences, but um, we got through that in a fairly short amount of time because um, the old system didn't work anymore. So yeah. <laughs> this is where, this is where you put tickets in and, and the, the user experience, although it was very different, um, was very well thought out and, and intuitive. Yep. So, yeah. I think you made a point there that I, I, I want to highlight as well as another thing that tools will help you along your journey with. And you said, you know, that you got it done over the weekend, but really you finished 90% of it Friday night. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, that there speaks to the right kind of tooling as well. So if you're on a system that takes six plus months and a software development team to modify for your workflow, you can never hope to be agile because your tool is gonna to be holding you down like an anchor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you, just to kind of butt in here, if you will, how do you then get that buy-in from those C levels? I mean. We know, I guess I shouldn't say we know, but you can get that buy-in, but then that regular, you know, that more, the bigger folk, right? The folk that are right there, the ones that are actually going to be doing those process. Like, how do you, Marcus or Ken, how do you get that buy-in from them? Yeah, I always talk about how um, 
executive sponsorship is important, but executive participation is crucial. Mm, yeah. They, uh, we tend to start our engagements in that, at that C-suite level or at a gigantic global corporation, you know, at, at least at the business unit, you know, leadership level. Yeah. Um, and explain, you know, it's kind of, um, it, it can, it's tough to pull off sometimes, but really we're vetting them as much as they're vetting us mm. in the, in the early parts of the engagement. And we might start with a small engagement that's, that's, um, you know, strategic, uh, discussions and things like that, where, um, sometimes if the leadership is just going, no, just put the tool in and go and leave, um, it's not they're not going to end up happy we could do exactly what they say and it is not going to make them happy um <clears throat> i just think the clarity of communication of that right at the top is really 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 important and there's no there's no simple answer to that very good question but maybe ken has one um yeah, there, I think there's a couple of quick points to make there. Uh, one of the great things I like working about at Lassian is I get the ability to say, no, that's not the right product for you. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not afraid to say to the CTO, um, no, um, Jira is the wrong place for that kind of work to happen. You know, it's very rare that I say something like that, but, you know, sometimes they'll come in with this really wacky, you know, use case and it's, you know, like, hey, maybe we should think about the way you're working. And they're like, no, 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 this is the way we're going to work. And I'm like, well, that's not really going to work in the tool, you know, without serious modification. So it may not be appropriate for you. You know, you should maybe stick with your custom built tool that you've spent 30 years building. Um, the other is, is I think the champions have to come from both levels. You know, you mm -hmm. mentioned the executive champion, certainly very critical. Um, you also will find that you need, I think, the team level champion as well, somebody that's passionate about it. Um, and, and you also mentioned a point of, you know, starting with something that maybe is a little bit smaller. I think that's a great idea because often what I'll tell government agencies is like, if you've got a new program spinning up and you're not doing agile anywhere else in, in your agency, uh, unlikely at this point, but if you're not aware of it, um, do that, do agile with them. They're, they're a greenfield, right? make them your star and your shining example. And then other people will flock to that because it's like, they're getting all the accolades. I want the accolades too. How do I get that? Mm -hmm. Well, you use these tools, you use these processes, you adopt this kind of culture and you'll have the same success. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen that work over and over again. And you're, you're right to point out, you need champions above and below. Different. Yeah. At different levels. Yeah. So, um, the final question here has to do a lot with um, what you talked about earlier, Ken, not necessarily IT, the IT world, but how are non-technical teams like HR in my place or marketing becoming a part of their company's digital transformations? Yeah, so I think tech always leads the way, of course. Um, I think we tend to have a bit more of the the crowd that likes to look outside the box and, and break things, not, not to put any other team down. I think it's just our natural inclination as creative individuals to do things like that. Um, you know, but you look at, at HR systems and you know, again, they're antiquated, right? It take months to change uh, and the HR process is not working or not keeping up and they're frustrated with it, right? So you, you talk to them and say, look, you can move like this too. We, you know, the example I gave earlier about the computer, I'm like, do you really want to be the person that's, you know, holding up somebody from working, um, achieving a mission or a business outcome? Uh, and the answer is always no, they don't want to be that person, right? They want this to work. Um, occasionally you run into people who are like, oh, uh, we can't work that way. We're not, we're not an agile team. Um, we can't work in these tools, right? We're not a tech team. That's usually, you know, uh, a misunderstanding on their part. It's almost always false uh, that they can't work in a tool like that. Um, so you can get them there. Um, you, you need to get them, you know, on the same tooling so that you can enable those, you know, cross team collaborations, um, you know, and, and you need to help them adopt that right mindset and to remind them you're part of the team, right? You're not just this off in your own little world. You, you don't have an empire. 
the business is the empire and you are part of the team. We all succeed together. Yeah, it's about global optimization, not local optimization to go back to lean and constant improvement yeah. like we were talking about. Yeah. And it's also, that also might be another opportunity to find, um, like you talked about a Greenfield, a, a new initiative or something, Ken. Um, if HR says, no, thank you, um, but facility says, okay, we'll try it, then you start with facilities. Yeah. And everybody's talking about how, holy cow, like the facilities tickets are just getting rocked right on through this process. And yeah. when it's a, a facilities ticket that needs uh, an operations person because the land's down or whatever, um, those are just, those just go smooth as silk. Then maybe yep. HR comes back and says, well, we didn't realize you were talking about that. That, yep. that actually sounds great. We can be a part of this global optimization and have this visibility and this, and this um, integration with our processes. So Yeah. I actually have another story there that, that highlights that. I'm full of stories, right? 10 years in the government will give you an endless, a bottomless pool of stories, right? Yes, um, it will. <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what happened at the agency where I was at. Um, the system that I built, you know, they're, they're, so you're familiar with, um, some of you are probably familiar with government data centers, right? And how they require paperwork to get into. To anytime you want to go into a machine room, you have to fill out a form uh, mm-hmm. with why you're going in there and all that good stuff. Off, right. Well, that was a Word document when I started. And then you sent it to the machine room manager. And there it sat for however long that machine room manager took to get through their queue to get to it. Right. Painful. Um, even their leadership was like, this has to change. Right. Um, we, we can't do this. this our, our people are getting inundated with Word documents. We can't track them. We know nobody knows what status is. We put yeah, it there's in here. a sense of safety, but no real safety, right? The, right. The, yep. For the sake of security, and it's not actually adding any security. Right. Yeah. Right. And sometimes they just get rubber stamped and they're like, because I'm too busy. So just go do your thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you just approved a breaking change there. I pulled the server out of the wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we put it in Jira and, you know, overnight it was, you could get a turnaround in less than 24 hours to get into there, sometimes same day if that machine room manager or their, or their designee was still in the office. Um, and it was amazing. You know, the, the other teams that they worked with who had initially rebuffed us saw that and they're like, the light bulb went on above their heads and said, we have to get on this platform too. Can we do our inventory in here? Can we, you know, all, all these questions started popping up, like what can't we do in the tool? Yeah, it's interesting how a, such a simple process can be definitely definitely made for the better when you apply uh, some of the tools that Atlassian has. Uh, Ken, Marcus, thank you very much for being with us today. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was very informative for me and actually made me go down memory lane to some of those yeah. dull uh, processes that we had in the government. I spent 15 years uh, before joining Mojo there, so you just brought back a lot of... Uh, Let's call them memories. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> They're good, right? I mean, it was a good time that I spent there. Yeah, that was good. Thank you very much once again, guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you for listening in to this week's edition of Ask Key Anything presented by Mosier Consulting. We hope you enjoy listening in to Marcus and Ken's conversation about Atlassian and how it can better serve you and your organization. In the meantime, please remember to give us a rating and subscribe to our feed wherever you get your podcasts. Quick programming note, though, because next week's episode will be our last episode of season one. Next week, we'll be going through our best of moments of the first season. But don't worry, Ask You Anything will be back, batteries recharge for our second season starting in July. Stay tuned for that and much more. We'd like to thank those of you who have listened in during our first season. We really appreciate your time with us, and we hope that you come back when we return for season two. For producer Brian and Mosier's marketing team, I am Angel Leon. So long, everybody.